All right, we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of Fast Forward Live. Uh, my name is Andrew Reed, and I'm a researcher at Cloudera Fast Forward Labs. Um, today, I'm going to be joined by my colleague and fellow researcher, Victor Dibia. Hey, Victor. Hi, um, hi, Andrew. How's it going? Doing all right today. Doing well. Doing well. Thank you. Um, so before we before we begin here, I just want to take a moment to preemptively apologize to everybody. If you hear any chirping or barking in the background, um, I actually got a puppy last week, and for anybody that has puppies, is probably well familiar. Um, they don't listen very well, so I apologize in advance. Um, hopefully, it won't become a problem, um, and if not, uh, Victor can yell at me later. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Um, and so right now, I'm. Um, Working out of Sunnyvale, California, uh, what is good? Um, Andrew, where are you out of? So I'm here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, weather is not good. It's actually overcast and has been raining all day. So enjoy the enjoy the sun for me, Victor. Yeah. Um, so um, if anyone of you are listening and you want to tell us where you're joining from, uh, what country, what state, what city, um, we'll be happy to to learn a bit more about where you guys are from. Yeah, so feel free to drop that in the in the chat now. Um, for those of you who have tuned in previously, um, thank you guys for joining again. Uh, for those of you that may be new to this series, um, to this Fast Forward Live event that we hold, um, this is our way, uh, Fast Forward Labs, our way of socializing our research and our work that we put out with the community. Um, and so we're actually streaming across three different platforms right now. So we're live on Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Um, and so we're actually able to interact with you through the chat on any of those. So as Victor said, please do say hi to us, drop us a link, um, let us know where you're streaming from. And throughout the presentation, feel free to ask questions. Uh, that's how we're gonna be able to accumulate the questions. At the end, we'll have a Q&A session and we'll be able to interact and chat with you about whatever sparks your interest throughout the presentation. So please do do that. All right, cool. So I think at this point, we're going to say goodbye to Victor. I think we've got a few people streaming in now I can see. We've got a few people joined. So Victor will be joining us later. Um, but for now, we're going to say bye to Victor. <laughs> see you in a bit. Sounds good. Um, and before we get into our main topic of the day, which is automated offline signature verification, I just want to give a brief introduction to who we are at Cloudera Fast Forward Labs. And so we are an applied machine learning research team here at Cloudera, and we work to make the recently possible useful. So what that means is we work to bridge the gap between these new advances that happen in the field of machine learning and try to demonstrate how those advances can be practically implemented. And our mechanism for doing so is really just to build things. Um, particularly, we like to build applied prototypes, and then we write about the process of developing them, um, what the eight prototypes look like, and the experimentation that goes along with them in the form of blogs and articles and reports like you can see on the screen here. And so for future reference, for anybody who's interested, um, you can stay up to date with all of our work by following uh, or subscribing to our new newsletter and also following along on our blog. Um, and I'm pretty sure the production team is going to drop the links for both of those in the chat now. Um, so feel, feel free to subscribe and follow along. All right, so without further ado, our topic for the day, which is also the uh, research topic that Victor and I have spent the past two months or so diving in on, which is automated offline signature verification. And just a quick look at what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'm gonna start off by framing what signature verification is and why it's important, why it's relevant. Um, I'll talk about how we can frame it as a machine learning problem and then also how pre-trained models uh, can be used as a baseline approach to solve the task. And then Victor's going to come back on and join us, and he's going to get into the meat of the presentation, which is really about um, our experimentation and work with deep metric learning as an approach to solve this task. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we'll have time at the end for a Q&A session. So uh, please do ask questions as we go along. Um, whatever sparks your interest, drop a note in the chat on whatever platform you're on. And at the end, we'll try to get answers to some of those questions. All right, cool. So signature verification, what is it? So <clears throat> signature verification really falls within this broader field of biometrics. And biometrics is this idea of capturing some unique user data 
So maybe behavioral traits like uh, voice, or in this case, handwritten signatures, or it could also be physiological traits like fingerprints, face scans, um, eye scans, any type of biometric data, and then using that to confirm a person's identity. And so here on the screen, we see that we have two, uh, given two signatures, the task at hand is to determine if these two, the signature on file and the claim signature are produced by the same or different people. And if there's, if it's by different people that could signature, uh, could signal to us that there's a forgery at play or that it's a genuine signature. And so that's the general idea. And overall, there's two different camps, two different schools of approaching this problem. And it's really dependent on uh, your acquisition method for the signature itself. So how you capture the data. So in one camp, we have this idea of online or dynamic signature collection. And this requires the use of a tablet or some electronic device that actually records the sequence of events. So the position and time of your stylus over as you write the signature. And so this, this, this approach, this data capture method lets you retain really unique distinctive features like stroke order, the speed of the, of the signature, maybe some pressure uh, data points and also acceleration. And because of this detailed information that you can collect these features, um, it's actually really hard to forge this type of signature. But the drawback here is that it's not very common. I mean, as everybody knows, signatures are everywhere, but they're not collected on a digital device. And so that leads us to the other camp, the other school of collecting uh, this type of biometric data, which is offline or static signature collection. And so this is where you actually collect the signature after the writing process has completed. And so typically what like most people are familiar with is you write a signature on a piece of paper, it then maybe gets scanned into a digital copy of it, or you take an image of a document that has signatures on it. And in this, in this paradigm, in this idea, um, it's much more ubiquitous. These types of signatures are everywhere, but it's also a lot easier to game because you don't have that time component. Somebody like a forger or an ill actor can spend detailed, meticulous time trying to reproduce the signature. And so because this project, this problem, this form of the problem is much harder and it's also a lot more prevalent, it's where we decided to focus our efforts within this realm of signature verification. All right, cool. So money, some of you might be asking, why does this matter? Um, there's companies like DocuSign today that make all of this digital, all of this is done online. Um, who needs handwritten signatures? And you're not wrong. Um, it definitely is on its, it's, it's phasing out the use of handwritten signatures, but that doesn't mean that they're gone. It doesn't mean that they're obsolete. They're still used everywhere today in fields like legal contracts um, or maybe administrative documents like letters and memos where you're trying to verify proof of authorship. And then probably the most common use case is this idea of bank check verification. So in banking, uh, ensuring that the checks are verified. And so we see this image on the right here this figure from the Fed um, that actually shows that over the past 10, what is this, 15, 20 years, the number of checks that have been written is in huge decline. That's, that's not arguable. But at the same time, there's still in 2018, 14 billion checks that accumulated to transfer a value of over, over almost $27 trillion. And so this may be a dying problem. It may be on its way out, but we're not there yet. And we can't just avoid it. We can't just do it manually. It has to be addressed and we need automated, robust systems to do so. And so this is the justification for why we decided to dive in on this problem. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, signatures themselves and some verification classes. And what I'm going to hope to do here is clear up some lingo and terminology that is used within this field and that Victor and I will reference throughout the rest of our presentation. So what we see on the screen here is we have in the top left is an original signature. Um, this data comes from a data set called the Cedar database. It's actually an open source data set that has 24 genuine signatures and 24 forged signatures for 55 different authors. So we have a collection of different genuine and forged examples across all these unique authors. And this is the data set that we've worked with for majority of our experiments. <clears throat> and so as I said before, in the top left, we can see that we have an original signature. It looks like it's by a person, someone named Deborah. The first outcome or, or class, verification class we have is this idea of a genuine signature. And simply, this is just a separate instance of that author's signature 
that's been written down at a separate point in time, a different point in time from the original. We then have this notion of a skilled forgery where the forger has access to both the user's name and a visual example of the signature, and they try to reproduce it as close as they can. And this ultimately is gonna result in high resemblance to the original genuine sample. <clears throat> and then the third type, the third class, is this notion of random or unskilled forgeries. And this is where a forger might have no prior information about the user or their signature or their name, nothing. But at the end of the day, you still need a system that's robust against these random types of, of signatures that are proposed, random scribbles, if you will. And so that's why they're included in our valuation. All right, so now that we have this frame of reference, let's talk about some challenges within this task of signature verification. And the first one that we can clearly point to is this notion of high intra-author variability. <clears throat> and what do I mean by that? Well, really what that means is that signatures that come from the same author can and ultimately will look wildly different signature to signature. And so if I asked you to sign your name today and right now and then sign it 30 minutes from now, maybe two hours from now, a day, a week, a year from now, we looked at all those signatures, I guarantee you they're gonna be wildly different, but that doesn't change the truth that they're all authentically your signature. And so this idea of this huge variability between, within an author's own signature um, makes this problem really hard to solve. Uh, alternatively, we have another notion of low inter-class variability. Here, the classes that we're talking about are between genuine and forged. And so if we think about that, the forger's job in this case is to reproduce a signature that varies very little from the original such that it, it, it can be passed as the original. So by design, by the, the nature of gaming the problem, the, the problem itself has this low interclass variability, which makes it incredibly hard for even expert humans to try to disambiguate these different types of signatures. Um, another problem we have is this notion of data availability. So anytime you're dealing with biometric data, it's inherently going to be sensitive. There's going to be PII associated with it. And finding, collecting, and securing this type of data in itself is a challenge to, to overcome. And then finally, we have data quality issues. So what we see on the screen here, these beautiful little snippets of four signatures, this is not how signatures occur in the wild. As you can imagine, when you sign a check, when you sign a document, there's often like lines underneath, there'll be background text that gets signed over, images maybe. And all of this noise really muddles the signal of the signature itself if it's not removed. And so it's a hard enough problem just verifying signatures it's even harder if you have all this background noise associated. So data quality definitely needs to be taken into consideration when trying to solve this problem. Okay, so I think we now have a general understanding of the prob problem space, why we're dealing with this and some challenges. Let's talk about how we can treat this as a machine learning problem. And really to do so, we first need to, to frame the problem as a signature or to frame the signature verification problem as a representation extraction problem where we're first gonna obtain a vector representation for each of the signatures in a verification pair. And then once we have these vectors, we can compute a distance metric between them, between the, between the two represent, representations, where we can say that signatures with distances that are below some specified threshold, so small distances, meaning similar signatures, uh, are genuine. And then signatures with some distance metric above a given threshold, are considered forgeries. So a larger distance between your representation means they're more dissimilar, means they're more likely to be forgeries. And so framing it in this mind is a good way to approach it. But of course, there's one giant outstanding question, and that's the big box in the middle. How do you extract a representation that can capture the essence of similarity in features of these signatures? It's a very unique type of data to work with. And so <clears throat> that begs the question, what makes a good representation? So ideally what we want here is a model that can take an image from this raw pixel space and map it into some kind of organized vector space where signatures that have semantically similar features and similar shapes are gonna be grouped together and co-located. And then we also wanna have uh, 
those with different shapes and different features that appear further apart from others. And so it turns out that to achieve a type of network like this, a feature extraction method, there's a few different um, there's a few different approaches that we've actually explored. The first one being uh, this notion of using just a pre-trained model. And so that's exactly what we've done. Um, we took a ResNet 50 architecture that has been pre-trained on the task of ImageNet. So basically just classifying everyday objects and images, completely different task from what we're doing here. We've taken that exact same network with all of the learned weights and biases that the network learned to, to do that task. And we pass every image from our, our data set, um, from our Cedar data set, through this, this pre-trained network to produce feature maps. So an, an, a representation of the image. And then we can perform dimensionality reduction on those high dimensional embeddings. And we'll use, we used UMAP to do that here. And when we project it down into the 2D space, this is what we see. We get this idea that, so here colors represent authors and each individual dot represents a given signature. And so we get this nice grouping of clustering where maybe this pinkish red cluster up here is all of Victor's signatures, genuine and forged. And then maybe this yellow one down over here is Andrew's signature, genuine and forged. And so we see we have this global, uh, this, this, this maintenance of global representation or global structure among authors. And then if we look even closer within these clusters, so we zoom in on this purple cluster here, we see that in this cluster, we have, we also maintain separation between um, genuine and forged classes. So all of the genuine circles dots appear in this upper left region, while the forged examples appear in this lower right hand region as diamonds. And so basically what this does is this, this qualitative look gives us confidence that extracting feature representations with these pre-trained models is able to preserve the global and local structure that we need to classify these types of uh, signature forgeries. And so when we do that, we actually then can quantify performance, which we've done. And so using just a pre-trained model alone, that's it, no training, we're actually able to get a classification accuracy of about 69% for skilled forgeries, the harder version of the problem. And then we can also get a um, classification of accuracy of about 87% for the easier version of the problem, the unskilled forgeries. And this is just using a ResNet 50 pre-trained model. No training has been done at all. So a lot of confidence is given here um, that this approach that we've taken will work. But of course, there's room for improvement. And that's where I'm going to invite, looks like Victor's back in with us. And he's going to explain to us how this, this notion, this concept of deep metric learning can really provide improvement upon our baseline that we established. So Victor. Awesome. Um, hi, Andrew. Thanks for that excellent uh, overview of the space. Um, and so at this, at this point, uh, what we know is that we can get really far with pre-trained models. And uh, the idea is that, you know, if we looked at the easy version of the problem uh, on skills forgeries, we can get as high as, I think, 86% accuracy. However, um, there are like two important intuitions that help us sort of reason through the fact that we can do a little bit better. And so the first is that is, is about data set differences. And so if we think of the data set that was used to train pre-trained models, and the, so these are natural images. And so they had things like cars, trees, houses. And so this sort of really differs from signature images. And so while a pre-trained model might have learned all these concepts like faces, doors, eyes, all of this is not useful for our task. And so you know, we want to find a way of fine tuning these features to uh, be more relevant to the sort of data we have in our, in our data set. The second has to do with uh, just the classification objective that's used within pre-trained models. And so here, um, if you look at the image on the left, you can see that uh, a model trained with a classification objective uh, essentially is trying to learn a linearly separable boundary between uh, classes in, in the data set. And so what it's doing, it's doing here is that it's trying to maximize the interclass interclass uh, uh, distances. However, for our task, we want something a little bit more precise, which is the diagram to the right, where we not only uh, maximize interclass distances, but we also minimize interclass distances. And so we shrink the distance between uh, similar items. 
And so even on the right, we see that, you know, even though the orange and the yellow items are sort of similar, um, even within that, they're just local clusters. And if we are lucky, we want this to correspond to things like um, uh, 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 genuine signatures and forgeries, but of the same, uh, of the same uh, general area. And so these are skilled forgeries. And so the, the good thing is that there are ways that we can bake in this requirement uh, into a loss function. And that is essentially uh, the whole idea of metric learning. And so metric learning allows us to learn a distance function over a, data, uh, a, a set of specific data samples. And at the risk of really oversimplifying this whole process, we can break it down into four, uh, four simple steps. Um, first of all, we define a data set where we have examples of similar and similar data points. And so this might be that uh, we have similar data points that are from the same class and the similar data points are from different classes. The next thing is we want to extract representations for each of these points. And then we want to compute some sort of similarity metric between these two and it might be a, a, a distance metric. And so this might be Euclidean distance or cosine distance. And then finally, we, we want to update the model weights of our models such that um, at the next iteration, it learns to really correctly produce uh, representation such that the similar items are close to each other in distance space, in some space, in some embedding space, and actually the different examples are far from each other in uh, embedding space. And so let's go into a bit more uh, detail. It turns out that research in metric learning sort of classifies this based and uh, structures this out, this whole metric learning space based on how your training data pairs are constructed. And so in one paradigm, uh, which is uh, the contrastive loss, contrastive loss objective, uh, training data is structured as pairs. And so if uh, each pair is two items, if they're from the same class, it's a positive example. And if they're from different classes, it's a negative example. And then we have triplets where we have uh, th uh, three items per, per example. And so we have an incur class, and then we have a positive from the same class and a negative from a different class. And then we have the quadruplet example where we have four items and, and they're actually the loss functions or loss objectives that have even more than four, four items. And so we experimented a little bit with contrastive loss. And so here we have pairs of positive and negative. And the, the, the objective is pretty simple. So if we look at the diagram here, um, let's assume we have uh, in a positive pair and we have uh, like embeddings for this positive pair. In the first example, we have that these things are far from each other, so we want to update our weights such that uh, they become close. And for a negative pair, if they're close together, we, don't, we want to update our weights such that they become far apart. And sort of, you know, following each training step, we want to see this sort of separation. Um, we conducted a bunch of experiments, again, on the CEDAR data set that Andrew mentioned earlier. And what we saw is that uh, we got like an increase in performance from about six, 9% on skill forgeries to about um, seven to two percent when we fine tune the ResNet 50 model, the same model, but using this contrastive loss objective. One thing I'd like to notice, uh, mention here is that uh, contrastive loss is sort of inefficient. And so because of the weight structure, you need to generate all of your positive and negative pairs uh, ahead of training. Um, in addition to that, uh, as your data set grows large, this, this space becomes really, really large and it can make training take a really long amount of time. The second thing is that at each training step, the model sees two, just two examples. And so it's uh, either two positive or two negatives. And so it doesn't really have a lot of information about the entire, the broader class structure of your data set. Triplet loss sort of helps with that problem. And so in this case, we have three examples uh, at each training uh, for each data instance. So we have an anchor example. We have a positive uh, example uh, from the same class as anchor and a negative example. And the objective is also sort of similar. We simultaneously want to minimize the distance between the anchor. We want to minimize the distance between the anchor and the positive and maximize the distance between the anchor and the negative. And if we do that, uh, looking at this example here, let's say these are embeddings before our loss updates. We can see that the, pot, uh, the negative example is close to our anchor. We want to push it apart. And the positive example is far from our anchor. We want to get it closer. And that's kind of what we, 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 we hope to achieve at the time train step. 
in practice, when we run a, when we ran a bunch of experiments, we saw that you know uh, our best model gave us about eighty one percent accuracy on skilled forgeries and very close to one hundred percent on on skilled forgeries. And so this this method works uh, quite well in practice. So what are some high level takeaways? Uh, so the first is. Uh, as a data scientist, always experiment with uh, pre-trained models. So in this case, they can be quite compelling baselines. And so if if your problem really is closer to the unskilled forgery sort of formulation where um, the attacker doesn't know a lot about the, the original signature, uh, using the pre-trained model gets you quite far. The second thing we learned is that the pre-trained model, the, uh, the triplet loss is a much better uh, loss function. And so two reasons, it's much faster to train. Uh, we found that it was about 10 to 20, 10 to 15 times faster to train uh, multiple versions of the triple loss, loss model con compared to the con uh, contrastive loss. We also visualized the embedding structure and so that you know it's a lot more interpretable, it makes a lot more sense. The third thing we learned was that skip connections uh, were particularly useful. And so for example, while fine tuning ResNet versus VGG, we saw that ResNet was a lot better. And the last thing we we, we found that was sort of interesting is that uh, our best model wasn't the one where we used the entire ResNet, but where we constructed an intermediate model using a subsection of ResNet. And this is sort of important because with this approach, we get a smaller model, it's lower latency, and it's a lot easier to deploy. So far, we've focused mainly on uh, representation extraction, but there's a lot more to this whole process. In fact, to uh, to perform signature verification in practice, there are a lot of other things you need to do. First of all, there's input normalization. So we want to threshold our image. Uh, there's also the whole process of image cleaning, where um, signatures might have all kinds of lines behind them, and um, they might have text and all of that. And we want to find uh, interesting ways of uh, extracting all of this background noise. In addition, uh, signatures may be located in arbitrary locations within the image. And so you also want to like find a way to extract or find the bounding box uh, that contains your signatures. And then finally, you might also want to match a signature against a really large da database of existing signatures, millions of records. And so these are all problems that need to be solved. Um, as a step towards that direction, we've created a library, an open source library called Simver, that tries to encapsulate some of all these uh, requirements. And so in this code snippet you have here, what it shows is that you could uh, use our detector method and you could give it an image and it'll tell you um, all of the, it'll give you a list of bounding boxes within uh, that it thinks that signatures, signatures exist uh, with some confidence level. You could also take each of these signatures you've gotten and get like a representation of each of them. So using our best uh, metric mo learning model. And then finally, you can compute cosine distances and run verification. Um, of course, Sinver is fairly experimental. Um, and so, but it's a great way for you to try out some of the models we've built uh, uh, while going through this whole exercise. One other thing you might notice in this presentation is that uh, we've, uh, we've simplified a lot of the concepts. And so here, the goal was to give you a high level overview of the space. And so we haven't talked about uh, academic references, uh, the mathematics of many of the equations here, and um, also details on how we trained the model, how we selected that threshold. There's just a lot of things that we didn't cover here. The good news is that we've written these three blog posts that should cover all of that. And uh, if you go to blog.fastforwardlabs.com, uh, you should be able to find each of these posts. So an introduction, um, how we perform the experiments with the trained model, and how we fine tune these uh, deep metric learning uh, models. And so at this point, um, now is a good time for us to uh, treat any questions that have come in. Um, Andrew, uh, did we get any questions so far? Hey, Victor. Um, yes, we actually have a few that have come through, um, okay. which I think we'll have time. I know we ran a little bit over, but we'll have time for just a few of them here. Um, so one question that came in through LinkedIn is, why is triplet loss faster? And I'm guessing that's faster than contrastive loss is the mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you take a stab at that, Victor. Right. 
Um, so one of the things we uh, uh, we glossed over uh, while uh, going through the presentation was the concept of uh, online triplet mining. So there's the whole idea that you know um, not all examples are equally informative. And so, for example, uh, if we actually have uh, a pair of positive and negative example um, where the positive is really, really close to the anchor and the negative is really, really far, it means that um, somehow the model in its current state already knows how to uh, solve the problem for this uh, simple example. And uh, we might have other examples where other situations, uh, pairs or triplets, where for some reason, the thing that is supposed to be a positive is actually far farther away than what it is the negative. And in, in the metric learning literature, there's a name for all of these things. And so there, there's a concept of um, hard negatives and easy negatives. And so it turns out that with triplet loss, uh, you can formulate the problem as something called online triplet mining, where you don't have to construct your triplet pairs before training but you can then select the batch and within the batch, you can intelligently select a subset of triplet combinations where the model can efficiently learn from. And if, it turns out that if you do that, um, um, you, can, uh, you, you don't have to explore the entire space of possible triplets. And then just that benefit gets you to train the model a lot, a lot faster to converge, convergence compared to contrastive loss. Um, well, Andrew, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, no, I think that that was that's exactly hit the nail on the head. Um, I guess I'll just add a little bit of context to it in terms of uh, how long it actually takes to train versus in contrastive versus um, triplet mining. And just for some context, I think it was like experiments with triplet loss in order to reach convergence took somewhere in the order of five to fifteen minutes, whereas to reach convergence with contrastive loss uh, in some cases took three to five hours. So right. um, it is actually a huge deal in terms of it's a, it's a huge efficiency gain by implementing or having access to this online mi uh, triplet mining strategy. Whereas in contrastive loss, you have to exhaustively train on every pair, even if it's not going to add any new or positive information to the network itself. Um, so it's a, it's a great question. And it's one of our main takeaways is that triplet loss definitely outperforms um, contrastive. Right. Well, one more quick question um, we've got here is, how can you implement these metric learning methods and loss functions? And I'll take a quick stab and Victor, you can add some context. Um, for our experimentation, we did everything out of the TensorFlow library. And in particular, um, there's a TensorFlow add-ons library. So these things that don't come prepackaged, but you can install on top. And so that's where we got the implementation of the contrastive loss. Um, and I believe uh, the online or the triplet loss and also online triplet mining the efficient algorithm the sampling algorithm is out of that package as well right that is correct cool um all right well i think that's all we had for you today i know we ran a little bit over um but thanks everybody for joining uh we really appreciate it we're trying to do these uh fast forward live events once a month or so, roughly. Um, so please do stay tuned, follow along on the blog, subscribe to our newsletter, and we will see you both on the. We'll see you all on the next one. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining. Bye.